All right, good evening, everyone. Welcome to our Wednesday night class. Um, we'll continue here in a little bit with our study that we began on Sunday, which is on living fossils. Um, and so we'll, we'll continue with that here in just a little bit. Before we do that, though, um, I'd like to remind us of those who are in need of our prayers. Um, so let's continue to pray for Brother Larry. He has an appointment in two days on the 29th um, with his doctors and care team uh, about his pituitary. Uh, Brother Terry's friend I have on our list, Dan Wendell, who's uh, battling with cancer. Sue Robinson, who's Tracy Taylor's mom. She also has liver, pancreatitis, and adrenal cancer. Ashley Compton has swelling on brain and spinal column. Uh, those who are traveling, is anyone new traveling this week that we know of? Okay. Um, and then those who we constantly pray for, Sister Helen, Brother Stan, Brother David, Weehy with their cancer treatments, uh, Brother Ben's mom who's been struggling with vertigo for, uh, for quite a while now, and everyone who's lost loved ones. Um, <clears throat> At it, including that, though, is a, a kid that I have on my team. So he plays with Braden for football, Braden's football team. And his dad passed away from a heart attack just unexpectedly, um, I think Sunday, Sunday night. Um, so his name is Ian, and their, their family is the Munoz family. So if you would add them to your, to your prayers as well. Um, that would be appreciated. Uh, and then my brother David is traveling to Kentucky. Is he still? He's back. Okay. All right. Good. And then um, he pray for Brother Terry that he'll continue to feel better as well. All right. Anything else that we need to add? Anyone else we need to add? Yes. Okay. Doctor tomorrow. All right. Let's pray that all goes well. For tomorrow, for Brother Terry. All right. <clears throat> All right. If there's nothing else, um, I'll go ahead and lead us in prayer, and then we'll we'll begin our study or continue our study on living fossils. All right. Let's pray. Father, thank you again for for all your blessings, for being our God, for choosing us, for now allowing us to be called your sons and daughters, for adopting us, for allowing us to be heirs, for sending your Son to come down and redeem us, to save us from our sins. I pray that we'll live each day with gratitude for what you've done for us and live out our lives as being grateful for what you've done for us and trying our best to serve you and the things that we do and how we interact with other people. I pray for everyone who's mentioned, Father, on our, on our prayer list, those who are grieving loved ones, those who are battling cancer, those who have other um, sicknesses and illnesses, anyone who is traveling, people who are not on our list, those who are struggling mentally, emotionally, um, financially, spiritually. Um, pray for the children worldwide. Um, pray for Christians throughout the world, those who have been persecuted, help them to stay strong in their faith. Father, thank you again for giving us this opportunity to come here and study and to learn. And I pray that this study will be beneficial to all of us and that I'll be able to present the information in a way that's understandable and that we'll be able to retain this knowledge and learn it and be able to share it with other people um, and help others to uh, understand the truth of your word and, and hopefully bring more, more souls to you. Thank you again for your blessing, especially for your son. For us of our sins, in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Okay, <clears throat> so... On uh, Sunday, we started with this topic of living fossils. And so I'll go a quick review, a quick recap. If anybody was not here Sunday, there are some handouts um, up here that you can grab <clears throat> or someone can get for you. But I'll go a, a quick recap. So there's, uh, it's important again to draw the distinction between the two models as far as origins, how things began and where uh, things started from. So as biblical creationists, we believe that that uh, the Genesis account of creation is accurate, that God created all the various plants and animals and all the life 
that's on this earth during creation week, um, and that these organisms have changed very little over time, other than variations in, in, uh, in distinct types of animals. So uh, there's lots of different kinds of dogs, but they're all still dogs. There's lots of different types of cats, but they're all still cats. And so there is variation in each kind of animal, but they don't change into other things, such as wolves, um, uh, wolves turning into birds or something like that. Okay, so um, there's variation within kinds, which is called, which in science, they've termed that uh, microevolution. We don't have a problem with that. We can see that it's observable science. You see um, animals, uh, populations of animals changing based upon natural selection. So again, I go back to Darwin's finches, the beaks. Uh, the birds, there are some finches had thick beaks because they were eating, uh, they were adapted to eating seeds and there's other ones that had thin skinny beaks and they were getting into the bark, um, you know, getting the bugs out and things like that. And so there's adaptations to the environment um, which can change the population but it doesn't change it into something else. The reason why we believe this comes from the Bible, uh, Genesis chapter 1. And so we read this last time, but uh, chapter 1, and I pulled out a couple of verses, verse 11, verses 21, and verses 24. Um, <clears throat> and it says, Then God said, Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb that yields seed, and the fruit tree that yields fruit according to its kind, whose seed is in itself um, on the earth, and it was so. So we know that orange uh, orange trees don't don't grow apples and if you plant an orange seed it's not going to grow a watermelon um, it's all according to its kind and uh, so verse 21 God created the great sea creatures and every living thing that moves uh, with which the water abounded according to their kind and every winged bird according to its kind and God saw that it was good so the plants um, the creatures in the water and the creatures that fly in the air God created them according to their kinds. They don't change into something else. And then God said, let the earth bring forth the living creatures according to its kind, uh, the cattle, the creeping things, the beasts of the earth, each according to its kind. So again, according to its kind, meaning that one kind of creature doesn't turn into another kind of creature. And so that's what we believe because God created things according to its kind. We can compare and contrast that with what science tells us which is that everything is here by evolution. So what that tells us, science will tell us that all life evolved from a single living cell formed by chemicals four billion years ago. So there's all these chemicals that are just around and then somehow these chemicals are colliding into each other and uh, magically produces something that's alive. So it's a living cell and then that cell is then able to reproduce and then everything that's ever existed has come from the evolution of these, um, uh, of starting from this single, single cellular organism. So everything is related in that way. Um, and so in this model, creatures are going to change into different kinds of creatures. And we've just gone over the fossil succession and the order of fossils and how um, that's used as an evidence that creatures are changing. So at the bottom, you have the marine life. And then it's supposed to be changing to, uh, to fish, like shells, then turning to fish because those are higher up, and then changing to amphibians, and then reptiles and mammals and so on. Um, but in this, everything is not created according to its kind and does not reproduce according to its kind. Things change. So dinosaurs turn into birds, mammals turn into whales, and things like that. <clears throat> that is the evolution model. It's also very important and significant in this study to know how this is supposed to occur. So the mechanism for this, there are three main things that are necessary um, according to evolution for this to happen. Things that drive this evolution from a single cell to everything else that's ever existed. All right, so the things are, first off, there's long periods of time, four and a half billion years. Um, it's supposed to be how old the, the earth is. And so in these long periods of time, that should give uh, even though it doesn't still, but give things enough time to evolve to, as we see today. Uh, there's also natural selection, so adapting to an environment. And so we look at Darwin's finches and we see that these finches have big beaks, these have small beaks, these have long beaks. And then we observe that natural selection and then they extrapolate that over millions and millions and billions of years and say that's how animals change in addition to mutations. So natural selections and mutations 
are the mechanism that causes everything to change into different kinds of animals over, um, over eons of time. Okay, so again, those three things are very important. Um, long periods of time, natural selection, so adapting to the environment which causes animals to change, we can observe that. And then combine that with mutations, um, and then that is how things evolve into uh, everything that we have today, uh, everything that we have existing today. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and play this uh, video clip again on mutations because we're going to be talking about mutations um, some today. And so this will just be a, a little bit of a refresher for us on we what should first understand mutations what mutations are, are and how they work. A mutation is any random change in the DNA of a cell or an organism. DNA is a long, helical molecule with all the instructions for how living things will develop. These changes can happen either through external factors like radioactivity or UV and X-rays, or through internal factors, such as when a cell is dividing and it incorrectly copies the DNA. DNA is the instruction book for how to make various molecular machines called proteins. Proteins make up an important aspect of our cells. They help our cells extract energy from food, do the housekeeping, and even make new proteins. These proteins and their function in the body lead to the traits that make us unique, like eye color or our blood type. Therefore, when the DNA changes, our proteins might also change, which could lead to a change in a trait. Most of the time, mutations don't cause a significant change. These are considered neutral mutations. Sometimes, however, mutations can be good or bad. When they're bad, they lead to diseases like cancer or cystic fibrosis. On the other hand, when they're good, it can allow an organism to more readily adapt to its environment. Okay, all right, so that was just a little bit on mutations. Mutations, again, are changes. They're, they're basically copying errors in our DNA. So when our DNA is transcribed, it's copied. Sometimes there are errors that occur. There's different types of er errors that occur. Um, but mutations um, can lead to different traits. Um, most mutations are neutral, nothing happens. But they can lead to different traits, whether good or bad, whether beneficial or not beneficial. Um, those can happen due to due to mutations, and so we add that with natural, natural selection, which is an animal adapting to its environment, and give it billions of years, and that's supposed to be the evolutionary mechanism of how things have changed from a single cell to everything else that's ever existed um, over that time period. Genetic All right, variation. <clears throat> so back to the topic, living fossils. This is what they are. Living fossils, again, these are organisms that are found in the fossil record that are still alive today. So there are organisms that we see in the fossil record, but they're, they're still alive today. There's a misconception um, that anything that we find fossils for, they're all extinct. Uh, but that's not true. There's lots of fossils that are found of animals that are not extinct, that they're still, they're still around today. And living fossils are what those are. And what we see from those living fossils is that those animals have changed very little, at, if at all, from whenever the, the fossilized animal creature was formed. Um, and according to our evolutionary timetable, then that would be over tens of millions of years, hundreds of millions of years, even a billion years. Um, and that organism hasn't changed, um, even though everything is supposed to be evolving. So it's not just one thing that we see as far as living fossils. We see all walks of uh, all, all, all types of life uh, plants that are still alive in the fossil record, birds, reptiles, sea creatures, insects, all types of living fossils um, that are still alive. And the significant thing, again, about those is that they are unchanged. They're, they're still the same, um, basically the same as they were in the fossil record, even though according to the evolutionary timetable that these things should be uh, hundreds of millions of old, millions of years old in some cases. Um, if not more. All right, so the significant thing about this, and this is about where we left off last time, is that living fossils, there are some implications to that. All right, so everything according to evolution, everything is supposed to be evolving over long periods of time. Everything evolves and changes over long, long periods of time. So the implications of these living fossils would be that either one, things don't evolve, even though there's been long periods of time, 
So if the timetable is right, that shows that things didn't evolve over those tens of millions, hundreds of millions of years. Or it shows, too, that there hasn't been tens of hundreds and millions of years, um, that that isn't right, or both, that things don't evolve and there hasn't been those long periods of time. Um, so those are the kind of the implications of living fossils. All right, and so here's Scientists another video. Studying fossil um, sea spiders I'll go ahead and show this as well. Rock found they are just the same as today's sea spiders. By evolutionary reckoning, that's no change in 160 million years. In that supposed time, evolutionists say, most of the dinosaurs, birds, many fish, and virtually all mammals have evolved all by natural processes, from finches to albatrosses and mice to elephants. They all made themselves by evolutionary processes. They also say that most of the flowering plants evolved too, and yet the sea spiders have changed in all that time. Curious, isn't it? The Bible tells us in Genesis chapter 1 that God created plants to produce seed according to each kind created, and he created sea life and creeping things after their kind also. This is the most established principle of biology, that living things produce offspring like themselves. These sea spiders illustrate this biblical truth. To find out more from Creation Ministries International, okay, so, visit our mm, website. This was an example of uh, sea spiders. Um that are supposed to be 160 million years old and you find them in the fossil record, you find them today and they still look the same as they did in the fossil record. Um, but the problem is that they still look the same. Everything is supposed to be evolving. So as he, he pointed out in the video, in this period of time, all of the, every mammal has supposed to evolve from non-mammal things. Every mammal has evolved during that time period. Um, the dinosaurs evolved during that time period. Um, fish evolved. All the flowering plants that there are, they all evolved. So all these things are changing during this time period, but yet these spiders are still the same, um, <clears throat> uh, which is a major problem for evolution because are things evolving or are they not evolving? And again, as I said, as I mentioned before, there's lots and lots and lots of examples of things that we find in the fossil record that are still alive today. And as I said, essentially everything in the fossil record that you find that's still alive and not extinct, is they're all unchanged no matter how old they're supposed to be. So here's some examples. Crocodiles, find them in the fossil record. They're in a rock, they're supposed to be 150 million years old. Um, but you examine the, the fossils of crocodiles and then you, you examine crocodiles that you see today and you see that they're virtually unchanged. How could they be unchanged in that amount of time um, if things are truly evolving um, as is, uh, they're supposed to be? All right, so 140 million years there. Here's another one. Here's, this is a tuatara, tuatara lizard right here. It's found in a rock that's about 200 million years old by their dating methods. 200 million years, the same, virtually the same. It hasn't changed. It hasn't, it didn't sprout another leg. Um, Nothing else has changed. Nothing has changed about that, this lizard, in 200 million years. Okay, that's a big problem. That's a major problem. So, <clears throat> not just reptiles, though. Uh, plant life. This is a ginkgo tree. We see the fossil of a ginkgo leaf right here, and we can examine that and uh, look at uh, modern ginkgo trees and see how they look. And what we see is that the... They look the same. They still look the same. 125 million years old for this one, and there's no change. Things are supposed to be evolving. All the dinosaurs, all the mammals, um, all the birds, everything was supposed to have evolved during this period of time because things have to change due to, that, due to their theory, due to both natural selection and mutations. Um, but yet we see these living fossils where nothing has changed. They're stay, they stay the same. Here's another one, horseshoe crab. Okay, this one is supposed to be 200 million years old. 200 million. So we don't, we, I mean, we throw these numbers around, millions, 200 million, 100 million. But if you really sit and think about just even 1 million years, how long of a, of a time period that actually is, it's, it's almost, you can't really comprehend it because it's such a, a big period of time. But this is 200 million years old and no evolution in those 200 million years. These are still, you can go to the aquarium down in Newport and go and touch these. They have them in there in the little touching area. Horseshoe crabs, 200 million years old, but no change. Nothing has changed about them. Nothing has changed about them. 
And then we have this one right here. This is called a Willamy pine. This they thought was extinct. They thought this one went extinct, extinct in the Jurassic time period. Um, so this would be uh, 150 million years old because that's the last place where you see it in the rock. Um, they haven't found any fossils of it after that, that uh, Jurassic, what they date as the Jurassic time period. So they thought it was extinct and then they found some um, in Australia. Um, and so it's not extinct, it's still alive, and there hasn't been any change to it in 150 million years, supposed 150 million years. Still looks the same. Nothing has changed when everything is supposed to be evolving during this time period. Okay, here's another one. So this, so we talked about plants and, and reptiles. This is an insect, it's called the frog hopper. This one right here is, is significant for a lot of reasons. Um, so again, another living fossil, we find it in the fossil record, we still find it. It's another one that's supposed to be um, from the Jurassic, um, 160 million years old. But what we see here is that it hasn't changed. And then this also gives us uh, another bit of evidence that things had to be covered quickly, things that we talked about before. So there had to be a rapid burial because these are fossilized in their mating position. Okay, So it had to be rapid burial again. Things aren't laying around for millions of years waiting to get covered up and then fossilized. Had to be rapid burial, which we talked about earlier on in this course. Uh, the same morphology means they look the same. Everything is still the same about them. And not only that, another significant thing is that they are exhibiting the same behavior as they exhibit today. So not only is um, their appearance not changing, their habits are not changing either over these supposed 160 million years. Okay, so that is very significant. There's no change in habits, there's no change in its appearance, its morphology, all of it the same. And then again, we see that this had to be um, covered quickly. Um, and so this is very significant because of the evolutionary story. The things that drive change would be changing environments um, and, um, and, and mutations. And so predators are supposed to have an effect on that. So things evolve to prey on things better and then things evolve more to not get preyed on as much. Um, and so it's supposed to be this constant evolution and changing of different types of life. Uh, but we see here that the behavior is still the same. Um, so this is a, a very significant fossil. So what's the big deal, someone may ask, what's the big deal about, um, about these living fossils? And we've been kind of pointed out, the, the big deal is, the point is that there is a lack of change. There's a lack of change, which is a huge problem for evolution, which is all about vast changes over hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of millions of years. It's all about change. Some people tell you that's what the word means. Evolution means change. So it's all about change, but then everything that we see in the fossil record that's still alive, we notice that it hasn't changed. It all stays the same. It all stays the same. All right, so evolutionists, they are aware of this. This guy, he's kind of a famous uh, or well-known evolutionist. His name is Jay Gould. Um, and him and Stephen Jay Gould and Niles Eldridge, they admitted that the maintenance of stability within species must be considered as a major evolutionary problem. So Stephen Gould and, and uh, Niles Eldridge. Okay, so they, they recognize that this is an issue because everything in the fossil record that's still alive is still the same, but evolution is all about changing and these things are staying the same over the time period that it's supposed to take for all the dinosaurs to evolve, all the mammals to evolve, all the birds to evolve, but these things are still staying the same. So that's a major problem. To that. <clears throat> and so, of course, there will be some uh, evolutionary responses to try and deal with that. And so we'll look at some of these and then we'll also examine why these, um, these responses, why they don't work. <clears throat> okay, so here's a quote from uh, someone, um, I think it was just in the comments or something of uh, some article that I was reading when I was doing some research on this. Uh, but this is, what he's, this is what he said. He said, there is no written rule that says a lineage has to die out just because an offspring develops um, a beneficial mutation. And then this is the part I have underlined. So this is kind of the part we're going to focus on. It says, the theory of evolution explains how species change over time. It doesn't say that all species must change over time. 
As long as the species can survive in its environment and pass on its genetic information to its offspring, it can survive indefinitely. Um, and then he says it doesn't mean that living fossils didn't speciate, it just means that those possible splits died out while the original lineage was able to um, successfully reproduce even into today. And then he asks the question, so how exactly does that not work with evolution? So what he's saying is that evolution doesn't say that things have to change, it just says that things do change or explains how things change that did change. Okay, so, but this guy is kind of missing the point um, <clears throat> because it's not about, um, it's not about if things change, it's all about, or not about things staying the same, it's about things not changing over hundreds and hundreds of millions of years. Okay, so again, evolutionists are aware of this, and so they have come up with what's called, we call a, a rescue hypothesis. It is called evolutionary stasis. What it is is called evolutionary stasis. Okay, and so here's kind of a description of what that is. It says, yes, I believe that animals have changed greatly over time, so I believe in evolution. Um, but some animals and plants were so well adapted to their environment that they did not need to change. So I'm not bothered by living fossils at all. And so that, this is a term that they call evolutionary stasis. So stasis means staying the same. So it's kind of an uh, oxymoron, evolutionary stasis, everything changing but staying the same. Um, and so that's what that means. So let's take a look at this. Here's another short video uh, that will kind of introduce us to this concept of evolutionary stasis. And then uh, we'll get into the problems that go along with that and why this excuse, um, this explanation doesn't work. Um, so here's another short video. In 1980. In nature documentaries and science textbooks, one often hears about creatures that arrived at their body plan very early in evolutionary history and have not made any real changes since that time, supposedly millions of years ago. These are called living fossils, like the coelacanth and the Walmy pine. This phenomenon is known as stasis, things staying pretty much the same. And it turns out that pretty much every animal in the entire fossil record appears suddenly and shows this same history of stasis. This was not predicted by evolution. A more recent and radical theory called punctuated equilibrium recognizes stasis in the fossil record but requires belief in rapid massive leaps in evolution, an unsubstantiated just-so story. However, the physical evidence, sudden appearance and stasis in the fossil record fits remarkably well with the biblical account of a recent creation followed by a devastating global flood, just as the Bible describes in Genesis. To find out more from Creation Ministries International, visit our Okay, so this talks about stasis a little bit. So with the, again, what it's saying, what the evolutionists say is that um, some creatures stayed the same while everything else was evolving, some of these just stayed the same. Uh, because we have evidence of that by looking in the fossil record. Uh, but a problem, big problem with that is, and which has led to another theory or another rescue hypothesis called punch, punctuated equilibrium, um, is that as we kind of talked about before, everything that you find in the fossil record, it just, it just pops up. And we'll get to this next lesson on, on explosion. So the Cambrian, Cambrian explosion, there's nothing that leads up to it in the fossil record. Everything is just fully formed, and it's there. And then you get to another set of rocks, and everything is fully formed. And then there's nothing that's leading up or evolving to it. And so they come up with another uh, hypothesis with, called punctuated equilibrium. But we'll stick on to evolutionary stasis for now. Uh, but there are some serious issues uh, that cannot be, that cannot be uh, avoided here, and they can't get around them. OK, so <clears throat> first issue with evolutionary stasis is one that it is self-refuting it's self-refuting that's like saying um, that all things uh, all things change but sometimes they don't change it's self-refuting it's like saying the sky is blue um, but it's it's not blue today so uh, it's, it's self-refuting and then what also is a major issue is that it must assume that the environments didn't change that these organisms are living in. Remember they say that if an organism is so well suited to its environment that it can continue to reproduce, then it doesn't have to change. It just stays as it is. So it must assume that the environments didn't change. And then the third problem is mutations. Third problem is mutations, and we'll talk about those um, here in a little bit. 
um, and how you can't really get away with saying that things don't change when, um, when there are mutations that are involved. Okay, so again, so evolutionary stasis. This, is, this makes evolution uh, a very, very flexible theory. So if you can have a hypothesis that is the exact opposite of your main premise, and that all still goes in the same theory, then that's, that's not science. You can't have something that directly refutes your entire premise, and that is part of your entire hypothesis, and that all works together, and, and that be science. Okay, it's a philosophy, which we'll continue to see. But it's a flexible theory when, whenever you can say all things change, but, but sometimes they don't change, sometimes they stay the same, even though all things change. Okay, so that's one flexible hypothesis, but that doesn't work. Um, because, again, when we look at these mechanisms for evolution, we'll see that the story itself shoots itself in the foot. So, again, long periods of time is where, are, are needed. Natural selection, so adapting to an environment, that's what's supposed to drive evolution. Things changing to adapt to its environment as environments change, and then add that with mutations, and then those are all things that cause evolution to occur. All right, so at this point, when we look at this, evolution really becomes its own worst enemy. The evolutionary story becomes its own worst enemy when they're trying to explain things away as evolutionary stasis. Okay, so first off, environments stand the same. They say the environment has to stay the same in order for this, for this stasis to occur. So the animal is so well adapted that it doesn't need to change, which means the environment has to stay the same. Um, <clears throat> so in evolutionary story, we know that it's the environment that drives evolutionary change according to them. Um, the problem is, in the supposed four and a half billion years that the Earth has been around, um, in, the own, in their own evolutionary story of the Earth, there have been multiple global catastrophes, multiple extinction-level events. Of course, not a global flood, but multiple extinction-level events that have occurred. Um, so how's, that, how's the environment going to stay the same um, if there have been global extinction-level events that have occurred? Um, <clears throat> so five of them, no less than five of them, there have been uh, multiple different ice ages, so the Earth... Um, cooling off and then thawing out, uh, forming ice ages in the evolutionary story. Um, and then we have to talk about the predators as well. So predators are evolving to prey on the, to prey on prey. And so that, according to evolution, would cause the prey to evolve to better ev evade those predators. And so this is all driving change. Um, but one thing that you can't say is that the, the environment is staying the same based upon your own story. Okay, so multiple global catastrophes, extinction level events. According to the evolution, the continents have arranged, rearranged themselves about four or five different times into all these different continental arrangements. Um, <clears throat> the predators, the ice ages. And then again, we find these living fossils across all different spectrums. So it's not just reptiles, it's not just insects, it's not just marine life, it's all spectrums of life. We find these living fossils that are supposed to be hundreds of millions of years old, but they haven't changed. But they say that they stay the same because the environment hasn't changed. But we know that based upon their own story that that couldn't be, that couldn't be the case because uh, you have these global catastrophes, these extinctions, ice ages, the continents are arranging themselves. So how is any environment going to stay the same in order for an organism to stay the same in that environment over hundreds of millions of years. Okay, so here's some examples of some of these mass extinctions that are supposed to have occurred. There's supposed to be one at the end of the Ordovician. It's about 434 million years ago. There's a late Devonian extinction. There's an end Permian one, end Triassic. And then we have the KT extinction right there at the end of the Cretaceous. That's supposed to be the one that killed off all the dinosaurs. But we have all of these mass extinctions that were supposed to have occurred and um, and yet we're also going to say on the other hand these environments didn't change so that these creatures not just one creature again the whole spectrum of them that they were able to stay and survive in their environment and not have to change okay so that doesn't work the evolution is its own worst enemy in this case 
Okay, so here's another example. They talked about this in the video. This is a fish that's called a coelacanth. And it was supposed to be extinct. They thought it was extinct 65 million years ago. Um, but it's supposed to be 340 million years old. 340 million years old. Now this guy, he was kind of a, a famous fish as well because you see these big fins down here. And in their you know, story, again, it's storytelling. But the coelacant was supposed to be one of those fish who was evolving to get out of the water. And so these big fins were supposed to be kind of like proto legs where the fish could kind of use the fins to walk around on the ocean floor and things like that. At least that's what they would say about it until these things were discovered alive and they weren't extinct. And then they study them and they show that and studies show that they do nothing of the sort. And so it's very easy to come up with a story with something that's extinct in the fossil record um, and nobody can prove you otherwise. But then once you find that it's not extinct and you see that the story was just that, it's a made up story. Coelacanth is a fish just like any other fish and it behaves like the one as well. And so here is, um, here is a, a quick video about the coelacanth. Stromatolites are regarded oh, by many sorry. as the this oldest fossils on They sorry. are interpreted okay. as the... Stromatolites are regarded by many as the oldest fossils on Earth. They are interpreted as the remains of colonies of blue-green algae, or more accurately, cyanobacteria. The oldest ones are claimed to be 3.5 billion years old. Within this evolutionary perspective, one would expect these colonies to have radically changed, but remarkably, they are essentially the same today. Stromatolites, therefore, are classic examples of living fossils. Living fossils cause major problems for evolution because they provide stunning examples of how evolution hasn't occurred. They also call into question the evolution evolutionary time frame. Some people try to downplay the significance of living fossils by arguing that when something is well adapted to its environment, it doesn't need to change. But this would need the environment to be constant for the supposed period of time. This argument cannot apply to stromatolites, because during 3.5 billion years of alleged evolutionary time, many radical environment changes supposedly occurred, including the arrival of new predators and parasites. To find out more from Creation Ministries International... Okay, so here's another one uh, with the stromatolite Again, these are, you know, this is, this goes back billions of years, a billion years um, that you find the supposed age of these, um, and then you still find them today, and they're unchanged. And again, the big part of this is you got to keep the change. You can't say things don't change. That's what the premise of the whole theory, that everything changes over time due to changing environments and due to mutations. All right, so you can't just all of a sudden say, well, things don't change um, because then you have to assume that the environment stays the same, which we've we demonstrated that if the Earth really is four and a half billion years old, then there's no way because there would have been uh, continents rearranging, ice ages, five different mass extinctions, the evolution of different predators, the evolution of different parasites to prey on them. So things, there's no way that things could stay the same over this period, this amount of time. All right, so <clears throat> let's say for the sake of argument, actually I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna get into this. We'll say this for, for next time. Um, but let's say for the sake of arguments that um, these environments didn't change. So for these, this coelacanth that's um, 340 million years old, let's say that the ocean didn't change during that time period. Um, <clears throat> this evolutionary stasis idea, it still wouldn't work, again, due to its own, um, due to evolution's own story. Um, and so I'll stop here for today. We don't have enough time to get into that. We've got about two minutes left before the bell. Um, but any, any questions or comments on that while we've got a couple of minutes left? Any questions or comments about that? Okay, yeah, right now. Right. 
Right. That's why we have these because as by dogs Right. Right. Yeah, that's a good point, and we may see that. Um, I mean, they, they're, they're kind of already there where, in okay, case so you have this one cell, and then it starts evolving, and then these things branch off and form different types of creatures um, from those branches, and then the, each branch kind of branches off. But yeah, that's, uh, that's a good point. It's interesting, and yeah, they, they, there's no, no choice but to, to cling to those four and a half billion years because the assumption is given enough time, anything can happen. But we, we all know that that's not true. Okay, all right, um, thank you. We will pick up with the rest of this uh, next time. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's comical if it would be so. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right, great. Thanks, Gene.
Good evening. Our first song this evening, before we are led in our opening prayer and then uh, the invitation, we song number 402, Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. At the conclusion of uh, the invitation, the invitation song will be number 470, uh, Do You Know My Jesus? 470 will be the song of invitation. But right now, we'll sing song number 402. After the singing of this song, we'll have our opening prayer. And after opening prayer, we will have the invitation. What a fellowship, what a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arms. What a blessedness, what a peace is mine, leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarms. Leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. Oh, how sweet to walk in this pilgrim way leaning on the everlasting arms oh how bright the path grows from day to day leaning on the everlasting arms leaning leaning say and secure from all alarms, leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. What have I to dread? What have I to fear? Leaning on the everlasting arms. Sing arms, I have blessed peace 
with my Lord so near, leaning on the everlasting arms, leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarms, leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. I'll be like that. Open it for Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you again for waking us up today, giving us our health and our strength, giving us the ability to come out and spend time together and to study your word and to sing praises and to, uh, and to worship you. Father, I pray that you will continue to be with us as we go throughout our days and, and throughout our weeks and help us to be good examples to those around us. Um, help us to show, uh, show your son to those around us by the way that that we act in the way that we live and the way that we treat others. Pray that you'll be with those who are hurting in the various ways that they're hurting, Father, and continue to protect us all and to keep us safe as we, as we try to do your word, do your will. Father, thank you for your son who you sent down here to, to die for us, and we're thankful that we have forgiveness of, of sins through him. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Good evening. Uh, I'd like to look for just a few minutes this evening at some of the words of Jesus from John, primarily the third chapter of the book of John. That's where we're going to start. The familiar verse to us, John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. I'd like to think about this. This evening, like, do you believe this? Do you entirely and unequivocally believe this? Backing up one verse here in verse 15, states, he who believes will have eternal life in him. And then ahead, verse 18, says, the one who believes in him is not judged. The one who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. So here... Jesus, in the book of John, is saying, believe and be saved, disbelieve and be condemned. And it can't really be said any more clearly than that. And as you read that, you might think, yeah, this is true, but we also need to obey him. And obedience is definitely part of belief. And John 3.36 states, the one who believes in the Son has eternal life, but the one who does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. So obedience is definitely important here. And John writes these truths about Jesus, that if we believe in him, we will obey him. I think that's a given. And if we do not obey him, then we're showing that we do not believe in him. And when you decide internally to believe in Jesus, obedience will be automatic. And you will do so out of gratitude from your belief. So what do, what do we do with this? So Jesus has told us, that we have to believe that Jesus is God's Son from heaven, and he's our only hope. And in John, the first chapter, John opens the letter with the fundamental premise that Jesus is the Son of God. I'd like to read a few verses from John 1, starting in the beginning of the chapter. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him. And apart from him, not even one thing came into being that has come into being. In him was life, and the life was the light of mankind. And then dropping down in verse 14, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory. Glory is of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. So here we see that Jesus is established as the Son of God. Going back to John 3, we see that Jesus is stating what he's done for us. Um, we, we see in verses 13, go ahead and read 13 through 15. 
No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, so that everyone who believes will have eternal life in him. This is referring back to Moses lifting up the serpent, and the people had to go to the serpent. And in a similar manner, Jesus was lifted up on the cross, and we have to go to him. So here we see what Jesus has done for us, but there's also things that we must do to be saved. So I'd like to back up, I know I'm jumping around John, but starting in the first verse of John 3, um, I'd like to look at the story of Nicodemus briefly. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, the ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus at night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with them. Jesus responded and said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless someone is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a person be born when he is old? He cannot enter his mother's womb a second time and be born, can he? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless someone is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which has been born of the flesh is flesh, and that which has been born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not be amazed that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it is coming from and where it is going. So is everyone who has born, been born of the Spirit. In verse 8 here, we see that everyone who has been born of the Spirit will be born in Christ. Um, and, and being born again, being a new creature, starting over, and that's what baptism is, and we need to understand that baptism is a new birth, going from not believing to believing, going from living for me to living for God, from living in darkness to living in light. And sometimes I think we focus on the how of baptism, but what it means to be born again. John twelve twenty four, Jesus, speaking of his own death, said, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. So here's some imagery from Jesus. You can't be stuck between the world that you want to be a part of and where Jesus wants you to be. But if you die, then a new sprout comes and God is able to create something more. And that's being born again, dying to the world. Um, it's a lonely existence to be one foot in the world and one trying to be one trying to live both worlds to be the wheat that falls to the earth but refuses to die and, and become a new sprout so if this applies to you and you realize that you want to be baptized the opportunity will be available to you here in a minute and you can come forward and be baptized to take the first step many of us have already been baptized but that's not the end of our journey we have to continue to choose the light over darkness choose Christ over darkness. And John 3, I'd like to read a couple more verses, verse 17 through 21, and then end after this. For, for God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but so that the world might be saved through him. The one who believes in him is not judged. The one who does not believe has been judged already, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world, and people love the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light, so that his deeds will not be exposed. But the one who practices the truth comes to the light, so that his deeds will be revealed as having been performed in God. So verse 19 says that the people of the world are evil because they're not pursuing Jesus, which makes their deeds dark and misguided. But verse 21 here, however, shows that the one who practices the truth comes to the light, and that's the person who will be saved. And practicing the truth, the truth here is belief in Jesus. We need to practice belief in Jesus, recognizing that he's the only light in our life, and pursuing that light and worshiping that light. So like to encourage you, if you have a need tonight, either to be baptized or to express any other need, I encourage you to uh, consider these things and make sure that your life is right with God. If you have a need from the congregation here tonight, I encourage you to come forward now as we uh, stand and sing the invitation.
certainly want to thank Brother Jason for those encouraging words and we appreciate the invitation of the Lord. Once again, if you're here and you need to respond, there's never a time that is not appropriate. You can give us a call anytime, day or night. Uh, we'd be very happy to sit down with you and open the Word of God. Um, we have several on the sick list that I want to mention before we're dismissed tonight. Continue to remember Sister Debbie Dixon. She's still having some difficulties with her back uh, with this weather. Brother Terry Thompson uh, is due to have a, an upper GI test tomorrow uh, concerning his ulcer, so let's be praying for him as well as for those that are doing the tests. Um, Sue Robinson, who's, who's Tracy Taylor's mom, Tracy and Tom used to attend here, is battling some very aggressive forms of cancer, so let's pray for her. her. Also, let's remember uh, Brother Larry Green with his enlarged pituitary gland. He is to see the neurosurgeon this coming Friday. So let's uh, remember him if that goes well. Continue to remember uh, those also that are battling uh, diabetes, uh, Sister Sharon Green's mom and also, also Brother Landon's uncle. And Landon mentioned in class tonight that uh, there's a student uh, is on Landon's son's football team uh, named Ian Munoz, whose father suddenly passed away this past week. So let's uh, remember that family. Continue to remember also Brother David Weehy. He's uh, due to have some additional skin graft surgery coming up. Um, Sister Joanne Zitt um, is having a little bit of difficulties with dizziness, so let's remember her also. And um, Sister Bonnie Russell is due to have some tests tomorrow, so let's remember her also in our prayers if that goes well. And uh, Brother Bob Species um, asked us to, if we would pray for him and for his, his housing situation. The home where he's staying has to go through periodic state inspections. And, um, and they've got one coming up, and they have not done well recently. 
and there's a threat to the possibility of them having to close down if this doesn't go well, which we know that would be very uh, difficult. It took quite a bit of time for Bob to be able to get into this place. So let's all be praying for that, that that goes well. The assignment sheets for the month of August are available in the back, and all the men are encouraged to pick up one of those too. Anything I missed there? Um, ben? Okay, let's, let's just all be praying for his family too. Adam? Okay. All right. So let's remember Debbie too. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. This time we'll be led in our closing prayer and we'll be dismissed. Let's pray. O oh Lord, our Lord, how excellent thy name in all the earth, the creator of heaven and earth, and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, for bringing us into your house to worship and praise your holy name. Lord, help us all remember to lean on your everlasting arms. As it says in your word, Lord, thy word is a lamp on our feet and a light on our path. Those who are sick and suffering, Lord, will among your congregation here, Lord, you just put your wonderful arms around because you are the great physician. Lord, as we depart from here, Lord, just give us the wisdom and knowledge to do your word that we can lead those into the light. Thank you again, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.